Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing BCE stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. BCE was formerly known as Bell Canada Enterprises. It is a Canadian holding company. The holding company includes telecommunications providers and various mass media assets under its subsidiary Bell Media. It was founded through a corporate reorganization in 1983 with Bell Canada, Northern Telecom, and other related companies. It is one of Canada's largest companies. The company is headquartered in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It provides mobile phone and cable services. It also owns Bell Media, which holds significant interest in the Montreal Canadiens hockey team and several Toronto sports teams. This company trades in the United States under ticker BCE. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, also BCE. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 50 billion market cap. They're trading at $55 a share and they have 903 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. This company has positive and consistent free cash flow. It's also pretty high between 3.3 and $4 billion a year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's also positive and consistent between two and a half and $3.3 billion. The easiest way to value a company is if they have consistent numbers. They don't have to be good numbers. They just have to be consistent. Then it's much easier to figure out the future. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's also pretty steady. It peaked in 2019 at 24 billion. It's down to 23 billion in 2020. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. An example is cost of labor. And cost of revenue are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. And that was the lowest in 2020 at 9.6 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Examples are depreciation, marketing, and insurance. And that was the lowest in 2020. So their operating income is pretty consistent. It was the lowest in 2020 at 5.2 billion, but it wasn't much lower than prior years. It peaked in 2019 at 5.8 billion. Then below that is the interest they pay in their debt then other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or other non-operational gains and losses. Below that is pre-tax income and then their taxes. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And you can see the company has a lot of net income each year. It was the lowest in 2020. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. And this company spends about $4 billion a year in CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. Free cash flow is the cash flow that's remaining to pay a dividend, pay down debt, buy back stock, or invest back into their business. They have about $3 billion of dividend payments each year. A lot of their free cash flow goes towards their dividend payment. You could see the company issues capital stock, but also buys back capital stock. So it's not really adding much stock. Same thing with debt. It issues debt each year, but it repays down debt. So it looks like it's buying back more debt than it's issuing. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate positive, healthy operating cash flow, you don't have much of a business. And they do generate a lot of operating cash flow, seven to eight billion dollars a year. And you can think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. 
And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, then you have to add back the non-cash items on the income statement. They pass through a $4.4 billion depreciation expense. That's a non-cash item that brings down your net income, but it doesn't affect cash flow. They also pass through half a billion in asset impairments. An asset impairment is when you decrease the value of an asset on your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. But that's a non-cash item, so we add it back here. They also had $500 million in changes in working capital. Even though the company reported $2.5 billion of profit, they actually generated almost $8 billion of cash flow. Operating cash flow is a better indicator of a company's health than net income because net income can be manipulated with accounting tricks. Let's look at the capital structure. $21 billion of equity, $26 billion of debt. Their 45% equity, 55% debt. And their WAC is 5.7%. And that's the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $119 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $108 billion. We divide that by 900 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 120. They're trading at 55, so they're trading at a 54% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is really close to me. They're at 123, so they're also saying the stock is really undervalued. This is the stock price the last five years. So you can see it was pretty steady for a while, then crashed in March, and it hasn't come up too much. So it looks like it's trading at a major discount relative to its all-time highs and also relative to my model and simply Wall Street. This company pays a really nice dividend, 6%. And to calculate the dividend payment, you could just multiply the last dividend payment by four, take that number and divide by the stock price. That's how you get your 6%. And they seem to be raising their dividend each year. They pay out 122% of their net income and 87% of their free cash flow. So there's not much more cash remaining after they pay their dividend payment. They have a really low beta, 0.3, so the stock moves a lot less than the market. It's not volatile at all. The stock has gone down 14% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 17%. The 52-week low is 46, the high was 64, and the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. When the 200-day moving average crosses above the 50-day moving average, that's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. About three to five million shares are traded each day on this stock, and almost all the shares outstanding are on float. Half the shares are held by institutions, and three and a half percent of the shares outstanding are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $19,500 today. That's an annual return of 7%. RBC is the biggest shareholder at 4% then Capital Research, then BMO, then another division of RBC holds 2.4%. Another part of RBC owns 1.9%. It makes sense that a Canadian bank holds a lot of this company's stock. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market's nine, the median is 14. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 20.1, so investors are paying $20 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 2.2. They have a really good price to sales ratio. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 2.3. They also have a good price to book ratio. The way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $21 billion of equity negative 2.7 billion of tangible equity because they have 24 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratios EBIT over interest expense. They can cover their interest payments five times. ROE is net income over equity. They have a 12% ROE. Current ratios, current assets over current liabilities. They can only cover 70% of their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are 200 million of cash. 4.2 billion of receivables and 400 million of inventory. They do seem to be undercapitalized. They did have three and a half billion dollars of free cash flow, 
but they have negative two and a half billion of working capital and a three billion dollar dividend payment. So they're going to be short two billion dollars. So they may need to take on more debt to run their business over the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on Rogers, Shaw, AT&T, Telus, T-Mobile, Vonage, Verizon, and Zoom. All in the same industry as BCE. And if BCE has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're a little worse in PE. They're a lot better in price to sales and price to book. They're doing bad in current ratio. They're a little higher than average in ROE. A little higher than average in debt. There are a lot of big companies in this industry, so their market cap is a lot lower than average. After AT&T, they pay the highest dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 54% discount. This is a giant company. It's not going anywhere. It pays a good, safe dividend payment each year. If you're looking for stability, this is a good long-term hold. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10. They're high and consistent. They're not growing much but they still report a really strong number. Revenue seven out of 10. They also have strong revenue. It's not growing much, but it's consistent. And I ranked their ratio six out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.